Welcome to a very special exploration video exploring inside of Horse Sand Seaport. The fort is one of four that were built in the 19th century to protect Portsmouth and the Solent against the threat of French invasion. We had previously explored St Helens Fort a couple of years back, which out of the four Solent forts is both the smallest and closest to the island. For that visit it was fairly straightforward, we just had to wander out first thing in the morning on a spring low tide, once at the fort climb up it and then we were straight in through an open hatch. The only thing that you had to be mindful of whilst exploring was getting back in time before the tide changed, although we were happy to make ourselves comfortable and wait out the next low one. Or Sands was going to be a lot more complicated. For starters, the fort is about two and a half miles off the coast of the island, surrounded by water and sandwiched between two busy shipping channels with strong tidal currents. As there was not too much in the way of information about the current state of the fort since being decommissioned, we went to scout it out to try and figure out if we could get in and how we would manage it. It was supposed to just be a recce as we were expecting to have to use ropes to climb up the outside, but as we approached it looked as though several of the windows on the first floor were completely open. Before I could properly confirm this with my zoom lens, Ben had stripped down to his pants and was overboard swimming towards the fort. Not wanting to be left out, and without thinking, I flung myself in after him. It was cold, but after we managed to clamber and scrape ourselves up onto the rusty landing platform, we climbed through one of the open windows and realised that the entire fort was open. Now that we'd established that it was going to be possible and relatively easy getting in, we just had to work out the logistics of getting several people with loads of gear in overnight without getting caught. This was not easy and took weeks to arrange. Luckily a couple of pirates with a yacht liked the idea and came to our aid saving the day and making the trip possible. On the day of the trip we met up mid-afternoon at the pub and after a couple of pints we were loading up the tender and heading to the yacht. The yacht was a lovely well-kept vessel from the 1960s called Ilya and her captain was a pirate called John. Once we were loaded we set sail up the river and off to the sunset. The conditions out on the water were calm and without much wind it was going to take several hours to get to the fort. Not that anyone really minded much after the beers and the rum were cracked and we were happy to enjoy the journey. We were also in no rush as we needed to arrive at the fort as late as possible to avoid detection. As dusk turned to night we watched a thunderstorm looming in the distance over Portsmouth. Thankfully it stayed away and we arrived at the fort around 11pm. We anchored up nearby and began ferrying across people and gear in the tender to the fort. It had all been plain sailing up until now, but something was about to go very wrong. The first couple of runs in the tender went smoothly with Ben calmly running the tender back and forth between Ilya and the fort. As it came to the last run, most of the gear was on the fort. John, Ben and myself all quickly headed below deck gathering the last few bits and to make some last minute checks. When we returned to the deck something was missing. The tender was no longer tied to the boat and she was drifting, engine idling somewhere out in the darkness. We got a panicked phone call from the others on the fort who informed us that they just witnessed the tender drift past with no one on it. Fortunately though they still had sight of it and were able to pinpoint it for us with torches. We frantically pulled up the anchor and set course for the dinghy. When we caught the boat we breathed a huge sigh of relief, except now the yacht engine wouldn't start. The rope that wasn't tied to the boat was now tangled up in the prop of the yacht. Ben and I had to take it in turns diving under the boat to try and free the rope. Each attempt was an awkward balance of blindly trying to unravel the rope in one hand whilst clinging to the rudder with the other. After about 10 attempts, exhausted and scraped by the barnacles, we finally get the rope free. Elated, we head back to the original anchorage and we finally make the last tender run, ensuring this time that when we get out it's tied very securely to the platform. We had several hours until first light, so headed up the rusty ladders to the topmost part of the fort where we could make the most of the panoramic views <laughs> and live the luxury fort life.
far too excited to sleep, as soon as the first glimmer of light appeared on the horizon, I was off exploring the huge structure. Paul Sands is the joint largest of all of the UK sea forts and was built with 59 gun emplacements across its two gun floors. The fort was built between 1865 and 1880. By the time the fort had been finished, the threat of a French invasion had diminished and the technology of the guns had become out of date. Because of this, the forts were never needed to be used for their intended purpose and became known as Palmerston's Follies after the Prime Minister who authorised their construction. The numerous forts built during this period were the most extensive and costly fixed defence structures built in Britain in peacetime. Four Sands was rearmed during the First and Second World Wars, and during this period the fort was painted in a black and white chequered paint scheme. It was painted in this way as a form of camouflage, the purpose being not to make the fort invisible, but instead to confuse attempts to attack it by making it difficult to accurately gauge the distance of the fort. The fort was deactivated after World War II and used for coastal artillery up until 1956. In the 1960s, the site was declared surplus to requirements by the Ministry of Defence, but the fort remained in military ownership up until 1993, when it was purchased by Portsmouth Naval Base Heritage Trust. The Trust planned to restore it and open it to the public, but put it back on the market in 2002. In 2012, the company who owned the neighbouring forts Spitbank and Nomans announced that they purchased horse sands and they intended to convert it into a museum with displays of the history of all three forts. Work was started to clear some of the debris, but the owner put the site back up for sale in 2016. However, it failed to make its 875,000 reserve price. Within the last month, the three Solent forts have been collectively put back on the market for the guide price of £11 million. As the tide returned, we readied ourselves to depart. It had been an amazing explore, but before we left, there was one last thing to do.